que tú naciste, nacieron todas las flores. Vivimos todos con gusto y placer a felicitarte. Y ya viene amaneciendo, ya la luz del día no dio. Levántate de tu cama, mira que ya va de Dios. I want you to think about a story. Any story, your favorite story, whether it be an Oscar nominated movie, a children's picture book, those really detailed and inspiring narratives on the back of really healthy cereal boxes. Think about the character you loved the most in that story. Why? What was it about this being that you felt so happy with? So sad with? So seen with? Well, for me, it's always been a monster. My monster. La Llorona. Todos me dicen el negro y llorona, negro pero cariñoso todos me dicen el negro y llorona negro pero cariñoso yo soy como el chile verde y llorona picante pero sabroso yo soy como el chile verde y llorona picante pero sabroso I have heard of The Legend of La Llorona before. I um, am trying to remember when I first it first came into like my worldview. I must have just been like a little kid, maybe uh, bedtime story age. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't think there was you no know, one uh, Hispanic that didn't hear about La Llorona and other. Uh, type of folk tales like that. I mean, there's we, we grew up with so many folk tales, but speaking of La Llorona, yes, you know, that uh, weeping woman that took her children, and, you know, it was, it was scary. Well, as far back as I can remember, uh, people talked about La Llorona. When you heard a weird cry at night or a scream, someone always said, oh, it's La Llorona. So eventually we would say, well, who's that? Quien es la Llorona? And they would tell us, oh, it's a woman who drowned her children. Being a 26-year-old Chicana, La Llorona has always been a massive part of my cultural fabric, in some shape or form. However, I didn't really understand her until I was at my weakest. This documentary sheds a little light on how a spooky story not only crafted a singular heartbeat for my family and I over this pandemic, but perpetuated a breath of survival for my people for centuries. Welcome to my world of La Llorona. Let's start from the beginning. Uh, a little about me. I'm uh, born and raised in El Paso, Texas. I am... I identify as Chicano, so I come from uh, parents who were Spanish-speaking and their parents are from Mexico. And uh, even though born in the United States and speaking primarily English, I grew up in a, in a in, usually in neighborhoods and in schools where Spanish was like, spoke like, like existed with English. And like, uh, I've always felt in reference to my identity as a Chicano was, I kind of haven't even adopted that term. Uh, until like I got older 
I would say, um, as a kid, I was the, the more fair-skinned one, and I didn't speak Spanish, so I was very much othered in school uh, for that reason, because I was kind of too white to be Mexican. And I, in a way, I kind of was, because I wasn't brought up to speak Spanish, and um, the way my our parents were raised, um, they kind of didn't they were taught to be successful by kind of putting that aside in school, but also by their parents. So I think it was natural for them to do that for us growing up. I identify as a queer man and uh, a bisexual man. So in a way, I've always kind of lived in two worlds. So I'm, I'm not necessarily straight and I'm not necessarily gay. So I'm, and I'm kind of othered in both. And uh, El Paso is a place like that, where it's like not necessarily Mexico, it's not necessarily the United States, it's not necessarily Texas, but it's really close to New Mexico, and it's kind of closer to New Mexico. <laughs> uh, so it's kind of, that's been my theme, really, through, through my life. It's just like I've had one foot in one place and, a, and the other in another. <laughs> I was born and raised in El Paso, Texas, and went to elementary up to high school in El Paso. My parents were born and raised, both of them in El Paso, but their parents, both my father and mother's parents were born in Mexico. But growing up in the 70s, speaking Spanish was a dirty language. Uh, it was very much frowned upon, so therefore I never you know, felt that it was necessary because we were embarrassed for one one thing, we were punished for speaking Spanish. Growing up, I mean, my mother, I mean, that's the thing, uh, that mothers always provide for their children. I mean, my mother and father always worked, as I mentioned, you know, early on from most part of my life, uh, whether my you know, uh, mom working in the bakery and my dad having the different jobs growing up to sustain us to have food on the table. So, but at the same time, very strict, a very strict upbringing. Being a mother, I mean, I don't, you know, my husband and I, we wanted to make sure that our children were cared for, and but the main thing was love. And even though my mom would say, you know, even though I spanked you, that's love. You know, and it was hard for me to fathom, well, how can you, you know, use some violence as a form of love? I didn't understand that. Okay, I was born in Mexico, in Parral, Chihuahua, which is about, I don't remember exactly, a few hundred miles from El Paso, directly south. And it's closer to Durango um, than it is to Chihuahua or Texas. And we lived there. Uh, we came over here when I was a kid. I was only a few months old. But we kept going back quite often for the next 10 years. The first time I noticed a difference was in Mexico, in Parral, when I was back over there. And the, some of the kids started calling me gringo. And I would ask them, why? I'm not a gringo. I was born here in this hometown. And they said, yeah, but now you're over there. And that's the first time I noticed a duality, as you say. Little by little, they be I, became to notice I began to notice those things. Um, the way we were treated by Anglos, basically. Not all of them, but enough of them. Because they would say, you people, or they would say, those people, or all of you, and that kind of thing. Well, as, as far as back as I can remember, uh, Grandma's house was haunted. Not just that house, but the whole city. And it was rampant, uh, ghost stories, and it, the atmosphere was perfect. Um, it was in the mountains, close to the mountains. There was no electricity, and I mean, it was very primitive in a sense, 
so the glow stars just fit right in. And, there, and you know, there were candles, uh, the stove used wood. Um, there were no fireplaces because it wasn't cold. It was, the uh, temperature was the same year round, almost. So uh, the atmosphere lent itself. And at night, the crazy noises, uh, <laughs> the wide open skies, the fireflies, it all fit in. And the mist on the river, yeah, so it was all very enchanted. The beautiful and sometimes terrifying thing about folklore is that it's oftentimes unintentionally passed down to you. It's amazing because you get all these traditions and cultures and magical stories, but it's also difficult because, well, as you just heard, a lot of us get generational trauma too. I had no idea that this narrative of La Llorona would somehow have both. For those of you who have never heard the narrative before, um, we'll try to wrap it up for you as quickly as possible. As best as possible. Like I said, it might have been, uh, I might have, they might have first introduced it as a bedtime story. Um, just, yeah, my dad liked to tell scary stories, so <laughs> I'm sure that's kind of how it started. We would be talking that night and on a particularly frightening night, whether it was raining or the wind was blowing or whatever. Being told to me as a little kid, either just to like, just for the sake of being scared or maybe just to like, scare us into just being like cautious. <laughs> I was hearing not really from my mom. I, it was just within friends that I was hearing this information from. Well, I, I'm thinking it was my, my older cousins. I was probably five or six, four or five or six. The, the version that I remember hearing the first time, uh, so there was a woman in Mexico and... Uh, it was the story of a woman that killed her children. And that's how they told us, that she killed her children, she drowned her children, they didn't tell us why. She was just very beautiful, I remember that much, and uh, she had children, I think from another marriage. I think her original husband, the father of her children, died in maybe like some like war or something, I can't remember the specifics, but uh, she was a single mother, and um, she met this man who uh, just, I guess, just kind of gallivanted into town. And he was just very um, attractive and very um, dashing. Because of the love of her man that she was enamored with and he didn't want anything to do with her children. They, they fell in love, but I think he was more in love with himself. And uh, I don't know if it was through the idea of like, her, him not wanting to like take over the responsibility of the children or just not be tied down in any sort of way but he ended up just like leading her on and then like breaking her heart and just telling her that he didn't want to be with her anymore or he was just going on somewhere else in life or with someone else and um, because she had just put all of her eggs in one basket with this man and she just saw like a future with him and she saw like her life finally like picking up and turning into something new after like the loss of her prior husband um she just basically broke so as a result she killed him she in in a lake she drowned him so she could be with this man. And it was she was just kind of like in an episode of like madness. And um, I think at that at which point she kind of snapped and realized what she had done after the children were drowned. Uh, she just became the weeping woman. That's what Laorona means. The, the the weeping woman, the mourner, the 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 figure. Her punishment was to wander the earth until she found them again just became like a spirit. I don't know if she killed her, I can't remember exactly if she killed herself or or she just died later from heart, a broken heart, but it was basically of that. And she just became synonymous with, with the river, like through like 
her tears and that are the same. And so she would hang around waterways, you know, whether it's the river we have nearby or the streams. And so she would walk around there, the waterways, and she would substitute, try to get children to substitute for the ones she killed. Her spirit haunts the river and looking for children. And I think that's where it came into play that um, it was told to me and uh, my cousins as children because it's like, oh, if you're not good, <laughs> you know, and you don't want, or you don't want you, the, the family that you have, I know somebody that does want a, ch a child of her own because that was the lore that she is constantly looking for her children and she might snatch you. And if we were the unlucky ones, then that was, that was, <laughs> that was on us Yeah. for being out at night. That was a story that I grew up with. I th I'm pretty sure that's exactly how <laughs> yeah. it was told, just to like warn you yeah. that, yeah, if you're not happy, I'm, I know someone who does want a, a little child of, of her own. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, it, it is kind of a deep, a deep thing to think about, especially as a kid. Uh, and and I, I, I guess that might be the point, just to kind of scare you straight and to scare you into like not wandering off the path, whatever the path might be. But, and it's just such a, a serious story of like, you know, heartbreak. And like when you're a kid too, you, you hear all the fairy tales of just like, true love is this and it's rosy and it's perfect. But this is a story of like, of, of love and how it cannot be that. And I think that also stuck with me too, is just like, oh, when I grow up, it it's, might not always be nice and clean and, and perfect. One of the most fascinating aspects of these conversations with my family was listening to the parts of the story that stuck with them the most. If you noticed, every single member had a different version and variant of the legend, even though we stem from the same roots. And if you listen closely, each person was scared of La Llorona for unique reasons. Sure, they all feared her, but the way she haunted each person was unmatched. As an adult now, thinking about the story and what, and what might scare me now in a different way than as a scary story, a ghost story as a kid, you know, you realize that you know, heartbreak is real, and um, existing in the world as someone who's different is is hard, is real, and it's hard. And when you think about the white man who she who broke her heart, and whose world that we're living in, it's scary to think about what that can do to you. You know, what that can do to someone who doesn't fit that mold. Um, it forces, it, it can bring out the worst in you and, and make you into a monster. Well, I mean, what mother would want to kill her own children? You know, a mother's love is supposed to be something so profound, so special. And for a mother to kill her own flesh and blood is evil. And later when reflecting still in my early 20s, I just realized, well, it was for a man, and the man didn't even want anything to do with her. So I felt more for her in terms of the, I mean, to actually kill your own children for love, and especially since it was unrequited love. I mean, who would do that? when she was really just a, a, a woman, you know, she's just a person, but because of all the trauma that she's been dealt and abuse eventually that she was dealt, she broke and she turned into that monster who killed her kids. Well, that's your ultimate safe area. When you're in your mother's arms or in your mother's presence, anything can happen and you're gonna feel good and safe. So when she herself, when the, when the female herself is the evil what you're avoiding, I think it just multiplies everything. Yeah, and she was treated badly. And so was my mom. 
when my mom came to El Paso, she was very unhappy. And I saw what could, I saw what a bad mother was. And I hate to admit that and say that. And it wasn't her fault, but, but it was bad. And maybe that's why it resonates with me, because it happened all around the same time. And I don't know, it's hard to say. Mm -mm. I don't think she's a bad person. And it's very sad. I mean, back then, I'd, I did. I thought, how dare you? But I feel sorry for her. Of somebody representing that they're bigger and better than that you need me and you would do anything for me. Being that lover, that macho individual that, you know, most Yoronas fall for. That's very sad. That's horrible. But that's why I feel for the woman that she actually, she felt that she was loved or that's what she thought love was, that nothing else existed. And she has children that love their mother, but yet she, she would actually go to that level, to that extreme of killing her own children for the love of a man. That's horrible. Something that she, I don't know, I mean, it, it, it completely overcomes her that she can't see and think straight. That does scare me as a, someone who relates more to her than him. Uh, I worry about my mental health and how that manifests over time because as you get older, you're forced to look at yourself more because you have to really have a sense of self to navigate as an adult. And sometimes, and by doing that, you have to unpack a lot of things. I'm scared of, of turning into a monster sometimes because sometimes I catch myself just being really harsh with people that I love when I'm just stressed. And, you know, we have to go through that. We have to live through that. Yeah. Very bad times. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. It's there. The scars are there. But, so yeah. I kind of miss it. You do? And I, yeah, I do. I did miss it. And that's why I think I told you guys those stories. Yeah. Because it was, <laughs> it was very scary, but it was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. And, you know, we would all be in the bed together. And you guys would be scared to death. And it was a lot of fun. We all slept very nicely. Well, you did, maybe. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else did. Yeah, that's true. Hey, Vinny. I wanted you guys to feel how I felt. Yeah. When I was a kid. Except that I was there with you, holding you. And safe. you guys would feel safe, right? Scared and safe at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. And for the rest of us that speak the language, that know uh, as Mexicanas what it's like to be put down, what it's like to be second to a man you know it's i think we, we as much as we like to say we're more well read we're educated and we know we have more self-respect and we don't have to take that so in that sense i think that's that's beautiful and yes you know what thanks to the art thanks to the written word and uh, this folk tale, you know, we will survive. We will go beyond to find our self-respect. You know, there are there. That's why it's a story. You know, that's told. Even if it's hard, there there's something that you can learn from it. I think. So my my takeaway is just like to, like from any hard or difficult movie or story, or anything. You just try to take. You try to learn from it. You try to learn from it and like by seeing one extreme you can avoid it in a way or just like um just be conscious of what could happen and try to approach things with love as much as you can because i think if there was just more real love in that story then it wouldn't be so tragic and it wouldn't be so sad
One of my favorite authors and Chicana activists, Dr. Bernadette Marie Kalafel, explores how the use of monsters or other iced creatures in narratives have been used as a device to represent BIPOC individuals for centuries. From colonization tactics used to silence minority voices to conversations eased with the creation of a metaphor. Monsters have helped us explain concepts that are far too difficult to explain in the real world. For the past 26 years of my life, there was always something unsettling about La Llorona. She was definitely scary being a ghost and everything, but I couldn't get past her sadness. It wasn't until I was creating this research years later that I realized it wasn't La Llorona that I have feared all these years, but the woman before the haunting. The emotional woman before the haunting. For me, Maria is a beacon of emotional awareness for the Latinx culture and more specifically, Latinas who are predestined to carry the world on their shoulders due to machismo. La Llorona is important to all of us despite our different gendered experiences or our specific cultural histories. La Llorona haunts us all. However, I like to imagine that by communicating, even through story, Latinx individuals and BIPOC groups alike can reclaim their quote-unquote monstrosities and be proud of them. Turn them into a superpower. I like to imagine that maybe in an alternate universe, after Maria's husband broke her heart, she was able to run home and talk to her abuelita about it. Maybe then, her grandma spoke about her previous heartbreaks and they laughed and cried over pan dulce and café. Maybe in that moment, grandma admitted to dealing with depression or anxiety and they both took a deep breath with clutched hands. Maybe that gave Maria the confidence to seek out some therapy or a couple of curandera visits to help express her emotionality. Maybe after all of that, she went home to her two sons and hugged them so tight, and maybe they started their own conversations of mental health that day, too. Maybe, even for a narrative on Latinx bodies, the story ends with a happily ever after for once. I don't know. Maybe. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, no.